Hi, I'm writer and actor Tom Conkle, and you are listening to a podcast named Scooby-Doo. Yeah! Hey gang, and welcome back for another episode of a podcast named Scooby-Doo. I'm your host, Mike Josick, and this week I'm going to be concluding the two-part interview that I conducted with Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated supervising director and producer, Victor Cook. Now we cover a lot of ground on this last half of the interview. Over the course of 30 minutes, we talk about Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, of course. We talk about Darkwing Duck the Hellboy animated films, the Spectacular Spider-Man series from 2008, as well as Vic's brand new show, Stretch Armstrong and the Flex Fighters, which is currently available on Netflix. So if you're a Scooby-Doo fan, or just an animation fan in general, there's something for everyone to listen to in this interview. But just before we get to rolling the audio on said interview, I wanted to bring up, I got an email. It's like the first email that I've received on the Scooby-Doo podcast at gmail.com account that was addressing anything that was in the show, which was awesome. Uh, I'm not even sure if I advertised the Scooby email, but Craig Heisel, self-proclaimed Scooby enthusiast, sent me an email. Uh, I'm going to read the email. He had a question. So Craig says, hi, I just have a question that maybe you have or will answer later in part two of the Victor Cook podcast. He stated that Mystery Incorporated was considered to be a prequel, but in Season 1, Episode 1, Velma is giving a tour and mentions the Minor 49er and Charlie the Haunted Robot. Maybe the timeline reset at the end of the series when everything changed? Just curious. I love your show and was super happy when I found it. Keep up the amazing work. Thank you, Craig. Flattery will get you everywhere. And I took your question direct to Victor and asked him what his perspective on that was. And Victor's answer was simple (laughs) and pretty much what I expected. He said that Mystery Incorporated is an alternate past. So even though it's a prequel of sorts to Scooby-Doo Where Are You, some of those same events would have happened previously and they would just sort of be happening again. I guess kind of a everything that's happened before will happen again sort of loop. I don't know. I'm happy enough with that answer. I hope you are too. So with that, I'm going to run the audio on Victor Cook Part 2. Hope you guys enjoy it, as I'm sure you probably will. And as always, I will see you guys on the other side. Let's look down here. Follow me. I'm, we mentioned Heart of Evil, and I mentioned Shrieking Madness. Those are two of like my favorite episodes on the show. Mm -hmm. Other shows like Man Crab and Mystery Solvers uh, and the finale, all great episodes. I wondered for you, either from the perspective of a a viewer or from the perspective of uh, the production end, what would your favorite episodes be? Okay. If you can Uh, remember any. (laughs) If I can remember the titles and names. All Fear the Freak, is that the name of that one? Am I saying that right? Fear the Freak? I think Fear the Freak, yeah. Which one was that? Was that that a season one ender? Is that what that was? I think was? that was the season one ender, yeah. I'm going to... Yeah, so so, so that one... Here. Yeah, yeah, take a look. Uh, that was really you know one of my favorites to work on. The The Blue Falcon episode was also uh, a super fun one for me to work on. Other ones that I thought were great that I didn't specifically direct, like Kurt did this episode. I think it was, it was something about gators. It may have been our first episode. Oh, that's the second episode. Second episode. I, mean, I thought it was... That, that sold was, me on the show when they mentioned the Gator Mines closed down. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was thought that was brilliantly directed by Kurt. It was awesome. One of his other ones, it was like the kids become like demon kids, you know? Right, yes. Uh, which I, oh, I'm so sorry I cannot remember the names of these sh- uh, episodes. I'm but terrible like, with these I, as well, yeah. But it's like, just it was like a little mini horror movie the way he, he did that. He, he was amazing. 
so there's just so many. I don't know. There's not like just like one. You know what I mean? The uh, truck episode, I'll, I'll say there were like sequences. Like it was fun playing with the mystery machine and having the mystery machine drive on the awnings and do cool stuff like that. You know, I remember I vividly remember working on the storyboards uh, with the storyboard artists, like working that stuff out. Now, that was the first episode you're credited with as far as the release. Was that the first episode you worked on? I think that was the first episode. That was the first script I got. That was the secret of the ghost rig, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, jumping back to Heart of Evil again briefly, we've brought it up a couple of times, and neither time have we mentioned the fact that you had Quest Labs in there. <laughs> yes. Um, I think I mentioned to you on Twitter, you posted a picture of it, and I was like, when I saw that initially, when it aired, my heart stopped for like a second. That was just so great. Yeah, there was like so many things, you know, like when, when these uh, other Hanna-Barbera characters would guest star in the show, uh, especially seeing the Blue Falcon and Dr. Quest and Race Bannon in the show, you know, designed by uh, Derek Wyatt, it's like, oh my god, you just wish they would do a, a Johnny Quest show in the style of Mystery Incorporated. So yeah, it was so fun. That's one of the biggest, like, mysteries to me, I think, as far as Warner Brothers and their animation department. Like, why has nobody tried to revive Johnny Quest? <laughs> well, we don't know that for sure. You know, um, I mean, I, I can see how audiences could uh, imagine that. But all these different companies have in their vaults all these different properties throughout the years. You just you don't know what they're developing or not developing until it's That's true. almost about, about to come out. So, I mean, I'm at Hasbro right now and I have a show on Netflix called Stretch Armstrong and the Flex Fighters. Who would have thought there would be a Stretch Armstrong cartoon? That's true. You know, I mean, there never was one and the reality is it's been in development there for probably a decade. You know, they were first developing it as a movie uh, before they started developing it as a, an animated show. So, so who's to say what's in or not in development someplace? Fair enough. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Did you see the, uh, the Tom and Jerry spy quest? No, I did not, but I, but I heard it was pretty cool. It's Yeah, it's surprisingly fun. I was yeah. watching it just because I had kind of a Johnny Quest craving, and it, it was a lot better than I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah. On top of Mystery Incorporated, you've also you worked on one of the DTV movies, uh, Stage Right, and you also worked on the the Haunted Holidays and uh, the Beach... Beastie, were those? Yeah. Were, did those come out direct to video initially, or were those for Cartoon Network initially, or? Those were all, I think, simultaneously directed DVDs and played on Cartoon Network or on demand someplace. As I was finishing Mr. Incorporated, that's when they offered me Stage Fright, and so I spent the next probably a year, year and a half after Mr. Incorporated working on those classic, you know, the DVDs are more the classic Scoobies, right? The classic Scooby styles. Right. And so uh, there was the, the long form stage fright and the the other ones were the 30 minute sort of TV specials that were uh, on DVD were packaged with other older Scoobies that were similarly themed. You know, if it, if it were a Halloween episode or a, or a sports episode. Kind of like when you uh, add new songs to a greatest hits album. Yeah, so they're they were really previously funny. released previously released episodes, but they would include one of these new episodes. Yeah, yeah. So they they're, so they were fun because you're kind of working with those EY Takaboto style character designs. Uh, you, you're not getting the Mister Incorporated sort of like the depth of character like you would, but they were still really fun. It's strangely some of the one of the most fun things about working on those things were like the main titles too. We did these like little main titles, and so it was yeah you would. You would do those in kind of different styles, you know. So Stage Fright had, like, my favorite, one of my favorite main titles that I got to work on. And those characters were stylized by uh, Steve Silver, who uh, was the Kim Possible uh, designer. And I had just thought those looked, like, really great. And uh, Steve Nicodemus art directed it, and he came up with the colors being sort of offset a little bit on the characters in the main title sequence. Now, you had also some of the... Like, Michael Ryan wrote your Haunted Holidays. Yep. And your... I can't remember their names at the moment, but the writers of Stage Fright also wrote... Well, Stage Fright was written by Doug Langdell, uh, or he was one of the co-writers. Right. Um, and uh, he and I... Uh, I've, I've known him since Darkwing Duck, so that's going way back. <laughs> when he was a writer and a story editor back on Darkwing Duck, and I was a storyboard artist. Uh, so it was great to, you know, we kept in touch over the years, but it was really great when I saw that script written by him, getting the chance to work with him again. 
The Darkwing Duck connection now explains how you ended up on Hellboy because of Tad Stones, right? <laughs> yeah, Tad was uh, the guy who hired me on to Darkwing Duck many, many years ago. And I actually wrote one episode of Darkwing Duck. And I think that's what got Tad to think of me or notice me as a, as a possible director at the time because I was storyboarding. And all of a sudden, the storyboard guy writes a script. So that was like really, I guess, unusual. That hadn't really happened. He... I don't remember ever really even talking to the guy much before that because he, you know, he's just the big shot, busy guy walking down the hallways really fast. But after I had done the uh, script, he did knock on my door and said, "Oh, said something to the effect of, oh, you're, you storyboard and you wrote the script. That's a great combination for directing. Have you ever thought about directing someday?" And I just said, "Yeah." <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I think that kind of helped me eventually you know, get a chance to direct at Disney. Is there a different approach to doing... I mean, obviously, there's the the runtime is, is longer on the uh, direct-to-video movies, but is the process any different? It's... Uh, do you just have more crews working, or...? It's, uh, you know, the, I'd say, you know, when, it's not like working on a movie where you have a lot of time, okay, uh, on these DVDs. It's, it's maybe a little bit more time than you would on a TV show in terms of the storyboarding part of it it's one long story so you know, you're you're really dividing parts up to the board artists by sequences it is kind of simultaneously being done like by acts and you you know it's it's not just a 22 minute story it's one longer piece so you got to keep it all in mind so it's again apologize for this long-winded vague answer it's kind of the same and it's <laughs> Kind of, di- kind of different. <laughs> I've spoken to some writers who've done uh, the direct-to-video movies, and they have spoken to it being a challenge to take that, you know, half an hour mystery and stretch it out to 70 minutes. <laughs> I was wondering if there's a similar difficulty in directing what is normally like the 30-minute mystery in, in a 70-minute format. Uh, it's... You know, it's just longer because you know that stuff. It's the, just the more story, work. It's 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 the, work, the story's worked out by the writers. You know, as far as stretching that mystery out to that, but you have to, as a director and, and the guy storyboarding it, still have in mind pacing, right? So there's a certain kind of pacing on a TV show, like an action show, for instance. You know, there's a certain rhythm to it that it's not like a formula, but I mean, there's a certain feel and a rhythm to it when you watch these. When you make these shows, it's just like watching, you know, a James Bond movie or an action movie to where it has to have that right balance, right? And, uh, and when you work on all of the half-hour TV shows, you kind of have that sense of it for that compact of a time. Yeah, so the challenge is how to sort of expand that balance for the, the longer version, you know? just want to jump back briefly to Mystery Incorporated. I wanted to ask you about the Mystery Solvers. It features... Hanna-Barbera characters I don't think anybody expected to see again, like <laughs> Captain Caveman. Right. Were you a fan of these characters? Um, there was also a stylistic shift. You guys visually went to more of the uh, Takamoto designs, the models. Yeah, for those, for those, we kind of like pretty much did those designs. Like I, like I said earlier in the interview, you know, as a kid, I was more of that the Herculoids, Adamant, Johnny Quest, Frankenstein Jr. I think it was more the action show kind of a kid back then. But I do remember watching, you know, Jabber Jaws at those shows and liking them and thinking they they, they were funny. But my my little, the little little kid Vic Cook was definitely into the the action shows. But um, so it was but definitely like... more of a kick bringing back Quest Labs than it was doing the mystery. I say I say at a personal level <laughs> the, the Quest Labs thing and. And uh, Blue Falcon was a thrill. Having Tim Matheson in the room was a thrill. But it was still a thrill to work on Jabber Jaws and Captain Caveman because I, I do have fond memories of, of it. I liked them. I was just more of an action kid more than the comedy cartoon kid back then. Right. Now, one of the things I ask everybody I talk to, uh, what is your favorite iteration of Scooby-Doo? And you can include Mystery Incorporated <laughs> if uh, just because you worked on it doesn't disqualify it. Well... It sounds so self-serving, but my favorite iteration is Mystery Incorporated. It is, to me, it's the best one. That's legit. Nothing to be... (laughs) You know? And look, look, hey, I've worked on Stage Fright, so even, you know, I don't put those up there. They're good for what they are, but I just feel like Mystery Incorporated just had a lot of depth to it, 
a lot of layers to it. The art direction was beautiful. The character designs were awesome. The writing, fantastic. The vision that Tony and Mitch had at the beginning that we all on the crew tried to execute. I think we did. It was just, you know, it, it, it didn't feel, it wasn't one note. It, it had these layers. And, um, and like you said, it sucked you in. It sucked a lot of people in. So I think it's the best one. So if you had like a lifetime achievement reel, Mystery Incorporated would definitely be on there. <laughs> it, it is, you know. Uh, I definitely, that is in my tops of all the shows. You know, I put that in my top two or three of all the shows I've ever worked on. You know, so I'm really so lucky I, I got to work on that show. Now, I'm hoping that you might have some insight into this, seeing as you worked on one of the shows that kind of maintain, you know, that 69, where are you, purity of concept, but also pushed boundaries. This franchise has been around for almost 50 years and it just keeps going and it's it seems bulletproof. What do you think is the reason the show still resonates with fans? Why why this is something that I mean obviously Warner Brothers won't let it die, but <laughs> well, there's something I there. Think... There's there's it's more than just a corporation like putting material out. I think, you know, uh, uh, one part of it is, like, everybody loves a mystery, right? Whether it's Sherlock Holmes or Columbo or or any of those great kind of mystery solvers. So everybody loves a mystery and a a detective story, and people love spooky things. So, you know, this has that element to it. I think also this property isn't – these days it's less and less. But, you know, how some shows or properties are, this is a boy show or this is a girl show. I think Scooby-Doo is uniquely not just a boy show or a girl show. It's an everybody show. So I think that's that's definitely an element to it. And then um, and then I'm going to go back to the famous three Fs, fear, food, and flashlights. <laughs> Can't go wrong with that. So I think that's why they endure. you know. And, and also each of these characters, you know, as they originally were these archetypes, and in Mr. Incorporated we would below the archetypes, but I mean people – can see a little bit of themselves or the friends of each of these characters. Good so answer. I think that's why, you know. All right, that's uh, that's it for the Scooby-Doo questions. Okay. We talked about the title sequence of Mystery Incorporated, which I love, and another show you've worked on, which you've also mentioned uh, during this conversation, Spectacular Spider-Man. That was another title sequence and theme song that I loved. And that show, I believe next year, it's uh, 10 years for that show, is it not? Yes, we're coming on the 10-year anniversary of the Spectacular Spider-Man, which was another uh, personal favorite of mine to uh, have worked on. And a show that ended before it was done. (laughs) Uh, Well, you know, we I guess you could say that technically we had an order for 26 episodes and, and, and we did it. We wanted to do more. So I guess you could say it ended before we were done, but uh, we did uh, what we were asked. But, you know, that that show, like Mystery Incorporated, had uh, self-contained episodes that also had story threads that went over a, a season of 13 episodes and ultimately a season of 26 episodes. So uh, it kind of had that sort of uh, aesthetic in mind as far as the storytelling, you know, a bigger story. It was also, was it not the first show where Sean Galloway was the main character designer? His first TV show, you know, I met Sean because of uh, Hellboy. I got to direct the second uh, Hellboy movie. And by then, Sean had wrapped up. He was sort of hired on as the conceptual designer. So he had concepted out sort of stylistically his version of Hellboy, which was all sanctioned by Mike Mignola, by the way. Mike personally handpicked Sean. And and this is before I came on. Corporately, there was some decision that the animated – Hellboys needed to have a slightly bit of its own look, I think probably for consumer product purposes. Like the movie toys looked like the movie. There were a line of toys that looked like Mike Mignola's comic books, and then these were, to, to make the, the animated version a little bit different, gave them an excuse to do another whole different toy line. So I'm giving you a little behind the scenes of how some of the, why these things happen. Yeah, my, my personal preference is that we would have done the Mike Mignola designs for the show. But on yet on the other hand, because they went this route, I got to meet Sean. And I did love Sean's take on it. So when I got the job on Spider-Man, you know, one of the things I had in the back of my mind about doing Spider-Man is I didn't want it to look as realistic or as detailed as the Marvel superhero shows had looked up to that point. They, The designs look great. They, they look like the comic book designs, but 
you know, but once the animators had to move them in 15 or 16 or 20 weeks, whatever they had, that's when you see things not move as fluidly. So I wanted it to be more simplified and have squash and stretch animation in it. And Sean's designs kind of had that feel to me. And so, yeah, it was his first TV show. So he really, it was, he was learning on the job, you know, I mean, he already had the talent, but he really was learning on the job about sort of managing and maintaining the style with other artists working on his stuff. Really cool show to work on too. And a lot of the people that you've uh, worked on, well, you worked on it previous to Scooby-Doo and that's. Yeah. Michael Gogan, season two director in Spider-Man. And he's a longtime Warner Brothers director himself. And um, he was already there at Warner's you know, when we were in Mr. Incorporated on something else and was coming free. And that's how we got him for a few episodes of Mr. Incorporated. But yeah, so first work with Mike, having him as a director was on Spider-Man. And there's a couple storyboard guys from Spider-Man that we that I brought over onto uh, Mr. Incorporated as well. And another show you're working on now, post Mr. Incorporated, you're doing Stretch Armstrong, which is now airing. Is airing the right word for Netflix? Streaming? Well, Available streaming. On yeah, Netflix? you know, like 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 they, like when it premiered, they call it it dropped. So it dropped on Netflix November 17th. So it's been out about a month now. You know, we are uh, doing this interview now. I think it's what is December 20th or it something. December 20th, yes. 21st. Yeah, so it's been about a month, and um, it was is an interesting project in the sense of unlike Scooby Doo or Spider Man, Stretch Armstrong was never ever an iconic character. There was never any backstory to him at all. He was a novelty toy, right? I mean, he was a looked like a muscle guy weightlifter in a bathing suit. So you didn't know who he was or what his job was or what his purpose was. <laughs> he was like this thing you played with. So, you know, they never made a show about him. There was never, you know, any storylines about him. And, uh, you know, the service of it, if you just look at that, you know, oh, yeah, it seems kind of goofy. What would you do? He stretches. So there's also that other thing of, well, haven't we seen that before? Mr. Fantastic and Elastigirl Girl and those kind of characters, Plastic Man. But the appeal of it for me and uh, the writers I'm working with and the crew was the Hasbro executive said, you only need to keep the name. You only need to keep the name. And there has to be stretching involved somehow. But other than that, you could create a whole brand new universe wow. uh, around it. So uh, so hopefully you'll tune in, you know, check out the show. He looks nothing like that toy. He, you know, he, he's a teenage superhero with uh, part of a team called the Flex Fighters with these two other characters. Scott Menville plays Stretch Armstrong, uh, a.k.a. Jake Armstrong. Uh, O.G. Banks plays uh, Ricardo Perez, who is the other superhero named Omni Mass. And uh, Stephen Young from The Walking Dead plays Nathan Park, otherwise known as Wingspan. So these three guys make up a team called the Flex Fighters. It's a brand new superhero universe. So, so yeah, there was a lot of, you used to tell people you're working on Stretch Armstrong, and the imagery goes to that toy. And people wondering, like, well, what's that? How's, how's that going to be? But... <laughs> The, the the show is really cool, so hopefully you guys will check it out. How many episodes is that? Twenty uh, twenty four episodes. Twenty four episodes. We have thirteen episodes on Netflix now, and then in early two thousand eighteen, we have a kind of we have a choose your own adventure kind of movie coming up, and that one I I hope you guys will definitely check out. It's. Uh, it's, I say it's like a choose your adventure because you know choose your adventure you got like these two choices one choice could take you that way the other choice takes you that way but eventually no matter either of the choices you come back to the same point until you have two choices again right but in our version it's very uh, complicated and detailed and the story can end multiple different ways interesting you know a typical choose your adventure can end one of two ways or use or one way and there's just like two ways to get to that one way so um yeah it's really cool and the other cool part about it is no matter which path you pick and ultimately what circumstances happen it still fits into the canon of our first season and the season that follows this choose your own adventure movie i'm not going to spoil it by saying exactly what the endings or climaxes could be but i mean we have some that radically go one way or radically go the other way. And you think, how the heck could that fit into the continuity of when you go back to the regular series? But it does. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't had a chance. And I'm working. I've been crushing. Yeah. I, I just, <laughs> go, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, 
I've been crushing the Mystery Incorporated episodes in prep for this, and I, I haven't been able to squeeze in any Stretch Armstrong, although I have previewed the first episode, and it looks fun, so I'm, I'm looking forward to... Yeah, I, I, I'd say, I mean, since they're all on at once, I mean, uh, the guys I, I work with, the head writers and, my, and the guys who I'm producing the show with, Doc Wyatt and, and Kevin Burke, who are really doing an, an amazing job writing on the show, they would say, start from episode one. I'm more like, you know what? I'm fine if you start with episode three. Watch episode three and then watch episode eight because they are like sister episodes. And then go back and watch episode one and two and then chronologically. And I, I only say that because, you know, the first two episodes are the, who they are and how they came to be, you know, who they are as personalities and characters. And you really get to know them and it's fun and how they get their powers. But episode three is if you watch any superhero movie, it's like, after the origin, right? This is who these guys are. And so that's why I say watch. You you might want to try my, my suggestion. Yeah, watch episode three. Watch episode eight. And then go back and find out who they really are and their backstory and how they got their powers. Well, see, now I'm glad I waited because now I'm going to watch yeah. them in your order. <laughs> yeah. Three and eight. Three and eight. And uh, like they said, they're sister episodes. There's another. You know, we all have our personal favorites. Uh, another personal favorite of mine is uh, episode six, which features this supervillain named Smokestack, played by Clancy Brown, and it was directed by Kevin Altieri, who was one of the original Batman the Animated right. Series directors. And so that one, a, another fun, fun episode, you know. But if you like overall, like how you talked about Mr. Incorporated and Spectacular Spider-Man, if you like episodes that are self-contained but still contribute to an overall story arc that's what stretch armstrong does it's a big story each episode is its own story but there are parts of it that, that continue on over a big story and you'll see the characters evolve you'll find some backstory information of certain characters you know we've all grown up with certain brands of superheroes right from the two big companies so we all know those very well this is an opportunity to, to see a brand new from scratch superhero universe if you tune in the stretch armstrong and the flex fighters did you find developing this show i mean when i first heard that there's going to be a stretch armstrong show it's like you said i mean he's just this <laughs> this muscle-bound toy guy that you stretch <laughs> was it a really rough slog getting it to that point where you could really roll with it or well, I mean, did okay, you come to your so, concept quickly? All right, so so honestly, like it was a phone call first, right? And if it were a Saturday Night Live skit, the, the phone call would be. And luckily, it wasn't Skype where we could see each other. And uh, and I got a phone call. Hey, you know, this executive wants to talk to you tomorrow. Are you available at this time? He wants to talk to you about one of the boy properties. So I had 24 hours to like wonder what it was about because they wouldn't tell me, you know, ahead of time. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking like Transformers or GI Joe, <laughs> <laughs> you know, those kind of things. And then when, when I get on the phone and he says Stretch Armstrong, it's like it's almost like I dropped the phone or something, you know? Like, are you kidding me? Because I thought that's it's it. Like I said, he's a novelty toy. It's like how how do you make a show out of a frisbee or something, right? All that I just said happened in one millisecond, even though it took me this long to say that to you, right? It was like when you're in a car crash and you see your life going before right. your eyes. I'm just like, oh my God, this does not seem like it's going to be a cool thing at all. But then he said, but here's the opportunity. It's it's not that toy. It's something new. We're keeping the, the name. So the guy has to be able to, there's a stretching element to him, but the whole backstory and lore and who the character is going to be and the city he lives in and the rogues gallery, it's all brand new. It's all brand new. And even how he's going to use his powers is not going to be the way you've seen it before. So, you know, usually the way you see these guys do these powers, stretching powers is they shape shift into the shape of a suitcase or the shape of a boat or something like that, right? Which is fun to watch, but we've seen that. Or they can, by will, just hold their arm out and stretch it like a block away to grab a cup of coffee a block away, and then it comes back, right? So we've seen that. So... I thought, well, what if bungee cords stretch, right? But bungee cords, you, something's got to pull it apart. Then if you let go of one end, it's going to snap back and be loose again, right? So I thought, st we, we're all brainstorming, like, well, maybe that's the, the key to this character is he's like a bungee cord. So in other words, centrifugal force or gravity 
is what makes him stretch. But then he's going to he can't hold that stretchy arm. He's going to snap back in the shape. So it just gave us all these opportunities for these kinetic action sequences. And he slingshots around and, you know, the way he gets across town and fights villains. It really opened the door for us to do all this cool choreography for him. And then on, on a personality and character level, like these three leads, they're all like such three different guys kind of going through what happened to them. You know, I mean, you haven't seen the show, but they accidentally gain these powers in, in, in this accident. So how they each react to it based on their personality is like really fun and interesting because they're so uh, distinct. But, you know, besides our three leads, we have like just a great cast on the show. Yeah, we have Keith David on the show. We have Will Wheaton on the show. Kate Mulgrew, Felicia Day, Nazanin Contractor, Walter Koenig, you know, Star Trek's original Mr. Chekhov. We just have a, a, a fantastic cast rounding out this new universe, this new world. And uh, we, it, I think it's just a real interesting superhero's journey. So it's been really fun. Hopefully you guys will check it out. Stretch Armstrong and the Flex Fighters on Netflix. It hasn't been out for very long, but have you, have you gotten any feedback on it yet? Yeah, it seemed like the fan feedback that we've seen online uh, has been, like, really positive. People seem to really like it, you know. I think there was that initial, like, sort of, like is it that wrestler guy? <laughs> is it that weightlifter guy? <laughs> you know, when, when they see the name. And then uh, I think people have been pleasantly surprised when they uh, watch the show. So uh, we're just hoping more and more people check it out. Excellent. Well, I'm sure some of the folks listening to this will take a look at it. It's actually one of the things that I... I do try and do kind of with the show. I mean, on, on top of the sort of archival stuff, trying to just dig out a history of Scooby-Doo, like all you guys have moved on to other things. You yeah. all have other projects. And that's always a fun thing for me to, if I love, you know, this show that this person does, and then I find out, oh, they've got this show over here. And, you know, everything just branches out and you start to find some new stuff. And Yeah, we, we, we do that as guys working on shows. So we like to like, you know, ah, you know, I like working with this artist or this actor in that show. So when I get in this show, I want to find something for them on this show. You know, so so speaking to that, you know, Gray Delisle, who uh, is Daphne, right, on Mystery Incorporated and, and a lot of Scooby-Doo animated product, she uh, plays twin villains on Stretch Armstrong and the Flex Fighter. She plays these twin villains called the Freak Sisters. She is uh, amazing at it. So if you're a Scooby-Doo fan and a fan of Gray, that's another reason to check out Stretch. Excellent. Well, that's all I have for you, Vic. It's been a pleasure talking to you about Scooby-Doo and your other animation projects. Well, thanks for having me on, and I look forward to uh, talking to you again soon someday. Absolutely. We'll, we'll get in touch with you down the road. Take care. Take care. And there you have it. That concludes my two-part interview with Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated producer and supervising director, Victor Cook. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. I hope there was enough animation-related nuggets in there to stimulate the brain juices and satisfy any behind-the-scenes thirst for knowledge that you guys might have. I always find that when I conduct these interviews, I go back and I'm editing through them, and I always think of like a dozen more questions that I want to ask, and sometimes I get the opportunity to, sometimes I don't. I'm sure we'll be talking to Victor again. Actually, as I mentioned in the last podcast, Vic does want to come back and do an audio commentary or two for some Mystery Incorporated episodes, which is fantastic, and I look forward to having him back to do those. But until then, if you want to keep track of Victor, you can find him on Twitter at Victor underscore Cook One, or you can just search Victor Cook on Twitter. He'll probably come up. And be sure to check out his show, which has been running since mid-November, Stretch Armstrong and the Flex Fighters. It is exclusively on Netflix. I believe the first 13, the first half of the 26 episodes that they have coming is available if you like the show, talk about it online, share it with your friends, the usual street level kind of guerrilla promo sort of stuff you normally do for anything that you love. And Vic also wanted me to let you guys know that in April, he and the head writers of Stretch Armstrong and the Flex Fighters, Kevin Burke and Chris Duck Wyatt, will be in Chicago at C2E2, the Chicago Comic and Entertainment Expo, doing a panel on Stretch Armstrong. So if you're in the area or you're planning on being in the area, check that out. I'm sure that'll be a fun panel, and you'll probably get to ask your own questions. You won't have to listen to just my questions. So, get out there. Make a difference. As always, I want to thank my guest, Vic, for being on the show. I want to thank you guys for being there, for checking out the show. 
And if you have any thoughts or things you want to throw my way, you can find me on Facebook, you can find me on Twitter, and you can find me on Instagram. Just search a podcast named Scooby-Doo or Scooby-Doo Cast, I believe is my Twitter handle, at Scooby-Doo Cast. I'm a little confused because I brought up the email earlier in the show that uh, I said it was Scooby-Doo Podcast at gmail.com. It's actually Scooby Podcast at gmail.com. So if you want to send me anything uh, on, on Gmail, Scooby Podcast at gmail.com. Pretty much everywhere else, I'm Scooby Doo Cast. I don't know why I did it different. I know there was a reason at the time, but there you have it. So you can contact me on Facebook, on Twitter, um, on Instagram. You can get the show on iHeartRadio and Stitcher if you have friends who use those platforms for podcast listening. And also, if you're getting the show off of iTunes, uh, please, while you're there, support the show, rate, and review the show. Getting that done, it kind of bumps you up in the podcasting standings, and it gets the show into the eyes and ears of people who may not know about the show, who may be interested in the show, and just haven't had a chance to kind of stumble across it. So you'd be doing me a favor, you'd be helping grow the show, you'd be super appreciated. And there's also the WordPress blog where I post stuff, so feel free to check that out as well. Thanks so much for checking out the show this week. Not sure who's going to be the interview next time around, so I'm going to keep that unspecified. But before we get the next interview, we're going to get one commentary, maybe two commentaries. Uh, As I said in the last episode, I'm going to be releasing the... Uh, Christmas commentary that I did with uh, Nick Robes from What's With You Scooby-Doo and John Colton Barry from Be Cool Scooby-Doo so that'll happen in between yeah so just uh, keep checking follow me on Twitter or follow on Facebook and that's where you get kind of all the news and you find out what's happening and I keep people apprised of what's going on with the podcast there you go thanks again love you guys see you next time on a podcast named Scooby-Doo And remember, there are no such thing as ghosts. Everybody cheer! This is how we solve the mystery. This is how we solve the mystery. So in summation, this narration is my donation to the art of mystery solving dictation. And here's what the bad guys say when they play where the law forbids. What a kind of way with it, too, if it wasn't for you meddling kids. This is how we solve the mystery. Bye.